OK, thank you, everybody, for joining um, the final session of the Thames Area Biodiversity Expo. And also thank you to all those brilliant speakers that have presented to us so far this week. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we make a start. There's quite a few people on the call, so please keep yourself on mute just to limit the background noise of doorbells and, and dogs barking, etc. Please add any questions that you've got to the comment box at any time during the event. And during the question and answer session, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. We will be recording the session, so if you'd rather not appear on screen, please switch your camera off. OK, excellent. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Phil Sterling, this morning's speaker from Butterfly Conservation. Phil was a principal ecological advisor to local government in Dorset, UK for 25 years. His considerable experience in large scale habitat creation schemes and managed the authority's highway verge maintenance programme and countryside service for four years. By introducing ecological principles into his work, he achieved substantial cost savings and environmental gains and brought wildlife into places where people live and work. At Butterfly Conservation, he leads building sites for butterflies, a national programme encouraging creation and management of amenity grassland for wildlife. OK, Phil, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for the invitation, Anita, and to uh, all of you uh, who are listening in this morning, or indeed who will be listening in at a later stage, um, given it's been recorded. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Um, so basically, I was put into a position at Dorset County Council where, well, the context is that we were facing, and I think as all public services were facing, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, austerity. So the r need to slash maintenance budgets very hard in order to preserve frontline services. And for local government, that was very much around uh, people-based services. So things like road verge management, um, road verge maintenance, just the budgets were just being slashed without any thought as to what the consequences were. And when I was brought into the service in 2014, um, it was very much around the the budgets had been cut so hard, so harsh that the numbers of complaints about long grass in urban areas became intolerable from from an elected membership point of view. From elected members, just wouldn't sustain it. And I was asked as an ecologist, "Is there a solution here?" And I said, "Well, of course there is, but you will need me." To to be in charge to be able to lead the change because the change that's required is actually as much as it is a technical change it's also a cultural change and it's a it's a cultural change in the way we expect to see uh, grass maintained and how it works so that's the story i'm going to tell it's, it's just a, a quick presentation just just a, just over around 15 minutes um, so the context in dorset county council was around budget saving but I knew it would also deliver more biodiversity. And the context, of course, changes year by year. And these days we are into very much. How can we use our environment to store more carbon? Uh, how can we use our environment to uh, make changes at population scale in terms of health benefits? So there are all these multiple benefits that we're looking towards the uh, environment delivering for us in our built environment, in our built spaces. And and um, this changing the way we manage grass, I have to say, I believe delivers on all of those fronts. And it's a complete change from the way that we have traditionally managed grassland. So here we go. Um, effectively, that's my title. Are we stuck with mowing amenity grass and low biodiversity? forever. Um, so this will be a familiar sight to you if you drive around the countryside and indeed it may be a pretty familiar sight on some of your more heavily managed um, uh, environment agency uh, uh, assets uh, where well, it, there's ever there's ever decreasing budgets to mow grass and when you do mow the grass you end up with this thick layer of, um, of mown grass that just sits there and rots. So from time to time in that middle picture, things look very neat and tidy. But actually look under the surface and you realise that that neat, tidy mown grassland is delivering very, very little for biodiversity. And we have 
hectares and hectares of it. Um, you know, vast, vast areas of road verge, and reservoir banks and embankments all over the place. And it just gets mown because it's always been mown and it's delivering very little for biodiversity. And it doesn't have to be that way. And much of that is about understanding this is a grassland ecosystem. And when we do that, all sorts of nice things happen that we like. And the first thing is that of all the things that we can control in the way that grass grows, it's soil fertility. We can't really control the rainfall, can't really control the sunshine or indeed the warmth. Um, but we can control soil fertility and of those four factors that are the principal reasons that make grass grow. So here's a little example. Um, this is in Weymouth uh, when I was working for the council. Um, my engineering colleagues uh, normally finish every bit of uh, uh, works with 150 mil of topsoil and chuck some um, amenity grass seed on it. In doing so, they are creating a re relatively high fertility system that constantly requires management. And you can see that on the left here, here's uh, a bit of the grass with 150 mil of topsoil on it. This is mid-April and it needs mowing already. And it will be mown six, seven times in that year just in order to keep the uh, highway verge functional, so safe, so that people can see in and out of junctions and to keep it looking reasonably tidy. On the right hand side, just a hundred meters apart, this is where they'd run out of topsoil and really couldn't be bothered to go and get in another load and spread out what they got. Same amenity grass. Look at the difference. It simply doesn't need mowing on the same day, just a hundred meters away. And that is entirely down to the nutrient levels within the soil. But look also at the biodiversity that's already in there. Yes, I know it's it's daisies and dandelions, but if you look more closely, there's a whole raft of um, uh, wildflowers in there. And that is the system we're working with. As soil fertility decreases, the plant diversity increases. That is true for virtually every grassland ecosystem in northwest Europe. So, um, so if we can get to a position where we can either design in or we can get to a position where we can maintain our grasslands so that they are at a lower fertility level, still performing the functions we want them to, but lower fertility, we will automatically draw in more biodiversity. And that is what I managed to achieve in Dorset and is now you know, seven, eight years into the scheme and they love it. So in terms of design, um, this you know, here's a here's a chalk bank on the Weymouth Relief Road that was constructed in 2009-2011, and I suppose you know it's rare that you will get an opportunity on natural geology to create um, uh, a low fertility system, but this system on chalk obviously works extremely well, but it works pretty much the same on any bare mineral soil, so whether that's clays or sands or, or limestones. Um, and indeed on the Weymouth Relief Road, we had, for those of you who know your geology of, Weymouth, of, uh, of Dorset, it's incredibly complex. And just even a short length of road will cut through a range of geologies. So on all of these geologies, we said either no topsoil or a very, very little, just 10% of the standard 150 mil. And onto that, hand sowed a modest mix of wildflowers, specifically to include one or two pioneer species, things like kidney vetch and oxide daisy, knowing that in very infertile conditions, these species thrive and produce a very good look very quickly. Um, and that was the effect of, of the road. Um, that's kidney vetch in the main that's come into flower within 18 months to two years. You've got, mm, I don't know, 80% cover of the ground in bright yellow, uh, kidney vetch flowers and that looks great it's a brilliant nectar source pollen source for um, uh, for bees but it's also a really important food plant for small blue butterfly and small blue is is a declining species nationally found from around sort of Devon up to northeast Scotland but it's it's definitely on the decline well it certainly isn't in decline in Dorset anymore the road verge is are still plastered with this plant with kidney vetch and the population of small blue just goes from strength to strength. There are thousands of them on there and it's a, it's one of those butterflies that simply responds well 
to the presence of its food plant. Here's the same verge in 2020. Now look what it's done. So we've allowed that ecosystem just to mature, just to, to succeed a little bit, and all the rest of the wildflowers are now doing well in there. Um, and so that was a, a end of May, early June 2020, plastered with, um, with pyramidal orchids. Absolute delight. And it's a road verge, but there's also a cycleway footway, so people can walk up and down here and enjoy the sites. And in terms of biodiversity gain, well, we sowed 30 species on there. The land used to be arable and uh, permanent pasture, so it had not a great deal on it. Um, 141 plant species now recorded on there in 2019 and 30 species of butterfly. Well, there are 60 species of butterfly that breed in this country, so we've recorded half of them on road verges that are about 10 years old. Um, I think we should take great heart in this because it does mean that we really can, through design, bring back biodiversity into grassland ecosystems very, very quickly. Um, and it's significant biodiversity. Some of these species are in decline. Adonis blue, small blue, chalk hill blue, they're all on that site. Um, some doing OK, some less so, but, but they're all on there and, and we've provided the habitat for them. But just come back to that centre picture that verge has received no management since it was constructed. The last person to step on there was me when I threw the wildflower seed out on there. Nothing's happened to it. So it, it maintains itself by and large. And at the moment, there is no there's no mowing program to be done on there. Nothing. Um, uh, I've cleared one or two Buddleia bushes from there every now and again. And that is the total amount of maintenance that that verge has received. Almost nothing. And so the maintenance budget collapses. On, on the back of that. And that's a very important point because that is what cyclical maintenance is something that 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 is just a bore for anybody who has to set up contracts to maintain grasslands. So where we can, we should be heading for low fertility because it not only saves us money, but delivers fantastic biodiversity. And uh, this is uh, the soils here are, are sandy clays. Not this is not on chalk here. So that's design. We all really would like to do this for our existing grasslands. We've got vast expanses of, uh, of um, amenity grassland in parks and open spaces and, and land around reservoirs, verges. And we can achieve the same or similar through the way we mow our grass. And traditionally we have cut and let it drop. And as we let it drop, not only do the cuttings then smother any um, possibility of, of herbs germinating, but you're also returning that fertility to the soil. And don't be too surprised when it simply grows more grass. You're also, you're preferring to, to you're selecting by adding fertility to the system, the competitive grasses, which will outcompete anything else. So if you move to a cut and collect regime, where you take away those arisings, then you end up with a system where you're depleting the soils of their nutrients and you're opening up the sward to allow germination and establishment of wildflowers as well as reducing soil fertility. And if you reduce soil fertility, you automatically increase the biodiversity. So here's a system where there's the potential to save money because there's less grass to cut, to increase biodiversity, um, by by taking away those nutrients, but does it work in practice? And the reality is, yes, it does. So having overcome, if you can, the more expensive kit, because the kit is 60% more expensive than by and large than a cut and drop mower, but the savings are there in that uh, these road verges in, in, in urban areas in Dorset were being mown five, six times a year on an urban cycle, and they're now mown twice, just occasionally three times. So potentially halving the uh, annual maintenance budget, but for that you require an upfront investment. And from my point of view, as the manager of the of the budget and the staff and the um, contracts and machinery, I set it up as a business case, simply on on the business of we think we can. If you invest in these mowers, we can save money, and that will be returned in either um, uh, less contracted work or staff able to be redeployed to be more useful elsewhere. And, uh, and that was proven 
in practice. That's how it is now in Dorset. Almost all of the urban verges are now on a cut and collect regime. There are a, a spread of mowers across the county um, which are doing just that. And here's some of the effects. Nothing outstanding in terms of wildflowers, but just common wildflowers. So here's a very boring bit of road verge just above above Sainsbury's in Weymouth. But look what it's been transformed from boring grassland into just a load of wildflowers. Hardly any grasses at all. And the grasses that are there are fine grasses, uh, the fescues and the and the and the bents rather than than the thuggy grasses of of Coxfoot and uh, and um, perennial ryegrass, for instance. And then this is in 2020, the same same shot, just a, a sort of a turnover of the wildflowers. Very, very pleasant. Now, I do accept that those wildflowers still have a height to them, but once you start maintaining grassland uh, using a cut and collect system, you can manipulate the sward height to whatever you want. So it's perfectly possible to produce uh, a very low sward height that's still full of wildflowers on a cut and collect regime. So here's lots of um, heraceums and and um, and uh, bird's foot trefoil and self heal in this ward. It's um, it's outside uh, uh, social housing properties in, in Weymouth and is on a cut and collect regime. And you've probably got 50% um, herberage turf there that that's supporting a whole raft of of um, pollinators of bees and the rest of it in between the, the the more regular mowing regime. And this is on about a four cut and collect per year. But in the middle of the summer, it doesn't need to be cut as often. And, and so the flowers are out there doing their bit. So disposal of arising is always an issue. Um, uh, is that um, at least the great thing about road verges, and I think the same would be true of quite a lot of EA land, is there's plenty of space within the highway to dispose of highway grass. And, and uh, the teams dispose of it in small areas, particularly in scrub, um, bramble thickets, uh, in planted areas of trees, uh, where it's safe and legal to do so. Clearly, they do not dispose of it in ditches and they do not dispose of it in anywhere where it would attract uh, fly tipping. But but there is there are so many spaces that um, that the, the teams have found and we're now seven, eight years into the program and it's just well, these these relatively small heaps of grass rot down, disappear and indeed are completely you know, the nutrients are effectively being converted into above ground carbon, which is also a pretty good thing. What's really important is that this is a cultural change. It's very much something that's easy. It's easy to uh, specify um, a number of cuts per year. And so contractually, that's what we've adopted nationally. It's just easy. You just pay for and specify so many cuts a year and on it goes. The change is very much one towards an outcome rather than output based uh, measure. And so we're saying, well, we want sward heights at whatever it is, and we want that biodiversity at whatever it is. And that requires a cultural change across an organization. Dorset County Council, as it was then, were very keen on that because they could see the cost savings as well as the environmental gains. So from an elected member point of view, this was a win win for them. But nonetheless, equally important as the um, as the change in the machinery and the change in the cutting regimes, the change in public perception. It's really important to be out there talking to people, make uh, you know providing information as to why things are changing. And as a result of that, I wouldn't say that in Dorset the complaints on road verges, verge maintenance have gone down particularly, um, but they have changed and there is now a balance between those people who are absolutely delighted to see slightly longer verges with more wildflowers um, and will respond to those who are saying that actually this is this is terrible, the county councils are, you know, absolving itself of its responsibilities. We used to have a nice lawn outside on, on our verge and now it's now it's got flowers in it. Goodness me. Um, so it's about a change. But uh, but overall, that change is something that members are very keen to support because they can see that they're doing their bit for biodiversity and for saving money in the public purse. Um, and saving money, well, 
the budget when I took it on was 927,000 for the road verge maintenance in the council. And this past year, it's been 501,000. So it's not going to be long before the budget for road verge maintenance will be half what it was when I took on the service. And I'm not sure that there's any local government service or indeed any public service that can claim that year on year it can continue to hand back money into the core because it's no longer required. So this fund, this is a fundamental change in the approach that's based on understanding what that grassland ecosystem can deliver for us. Now, we're all concerned about carbon, not just because of, of uh, COP26, but, but we are very interested in carbon. And I think we've got a bit of, a, we've got a bit stuck already in a mantra that the only thing we can do is plant trees. What we have to understand is that soil carbon is really important, and I'm sure many of you do. But here's a recent paper at the bottom there, which I would commend you to look at. Um, it, soil carbon is really important, and soil carbon is stored at various levels in that soil, um, but it's a complex situation. But of the few snippets that I've just put there, you can read them for yourselves. But the, the ones that I think um, are, are really important to know is, is that biodiverse swords are much better and have a much greater carbon capture potential than do monoculture swords, say, of, of ryegrass. Um, so flower rich grasslands are superior to species poor grasslands for carbon capture. And what's really important within that, um, red clover seems to be very important, but I think it's telling us something about rooting zones and rooting structures. Grasses tend to have fibrous root systems that don't go particularly deep, whereas a number of our stress tolerant plants, so red clovers, bird's foot trefoils, um, knapweeds, they have got much deeper, longer leathery root systems that, that penetrate the ground much further and are therefore have the capability of taking carbon much deeper. And I think that's an important part of our equation. If we want to use our grasslands to capture carbon, then the more flower rich we make them, the better they are. And I think the other important thing is to understand that carbon capture in created grasslands happens very quickly. You now, it can be a positive um, a positive number after just a few years and then continue perhaps forever, depending on how much maintenance that's required. Carbon capture in creative woodland doesn't really become positive for, for at least 10 years and perhaps 30 years. And that's a, that's an important part is that whatever we're going to do, if we've got to do it quickly, then my advice is to get in there and create biodiverse grasslands to capture carbon ahead of woodlands, um, although woodlands are obviously very important. So there you go. That's the um, that's the quick whistle stop through through creating and maintaining grasslands. Um, if we want more biodiversity, then then we can work with the work with the grain of nature, if you like. Understand that our very best grasslands for biodiversity are those which are on the poorest soils. And when we do create those, we can do all sorts of things with that. You know, we can de demonstrate that we can have cheaper maintenance. We've got significant potential for greenhouse gas emission reduction through reduced fuel use. Verges that require no maintenance don't use any petrol or diesel to, to, to look after them. Um, and, and we've got the opportunity there for carbon saving um, in the soils. And if there are safety critical areas, of course, they require fewer maintenance visits. And then people love wildflowers, so there are public engagement opportunities. It's got a whole raft of issues associated with it. I don't doubt those, but they need to be worked through. And and you can you can read those. But the, the bottom one, I think, is probably the one that is probably the most difficult to get through. And that's culture change within organisations. This is a fundamental change in the way that uh, certainly Dorset Council has is, is looking after its grasslands and and through my project um, building sites for butterflies you know my job is out there promoting this change for all the benefits that it brings within local government and within public service and indeed private sector across the country well there you go thank you very much for the opportunity i'm very happy to take questions thank you that was amazing thank you very much phil 
Um, and we have got some questions coming in. That's um, good. So um, Pete Taylor has asked, why does low soil fertility encourage more biodiversity? OK, so it, it's to do it's to do with um, um, it's to do with how plants allocate resources so that there isn't there's plants allocate um, their resources according to in three different ways so I think we can more or less think of there as being a group of competitor plants a group of stress tolerant plants and groups of ruderals and they are adapted to different conditions and so it's not if you simply pour more nutrients onto, onto soil you will lose out on some species not others so um, where we've got even conditions and high soil fertility, it favours what we call competitor plants. So those are coarse grasses, coxfoot, uh, false oak grass, hogweeds, uh, those sorts of things. You know, the sorts of things that you'll see on road verges in abundance these days. That's because we've created a high uh, even system which just grows grass that needs maintaining. If you create a low fertility system, those same competitor plants will still be there. But because they can't grab the nutrients quickly and outcompete everything else, they're just there as small plants. So coxfoot occurs on on our, our some of our very best chalk grasslands, but it's tiny. You get tiny, tiny plants. And when you've got lots of, you know, just a very few, um, a, a few nutrients in that system, you end up with the capacity of lots of plants to compete for what little is there and, and many of those plants and particularly our conservation value plants um, so those are you know orchids and, and our, our herbs that are important herbs those ones are adapted to those low fertility conditions they're all about survival year to year so they have complex root structures they put most of their effort into below ground stuff so that when the conditions are right they up they come and they grow but if they're grazed off, they're burnt or, or, or there's a drought or whatever, they can still come back. Ruderals, on the other hand, the third type, those are fast, fast growing. They, they simply they're in temporary environments and they come up and their effort is all put into reproduction. And so they'll go over. So something like Danish scurvy grass on on roadside verges these days, it's it's flowering by April and it's gone by May. It's done its business. It's it's finished. So it, it's way too dry and hot and, and harsh for that plant. But it's done a lot of stuff. So it's a classic ruderal plant. So the, basically, it's the way that plants allocate resources according to their adaptations in the environment. Thank you. If anybody wants to ask any questions, just um, feel free to put your hands up um, and you can come off um, mute and put your camera on if you want. Um, or if you'd rather just put them, carry on putting them in the chat. Um, Martin, would you rather just ask your question or do you want me to read it out? Uh, no, I'm I'm very happy to ask. Thank you for that. That was really, really exciting, really interesting. So I've, I've got a couple of questions because I'm like that. Um, so I was really you know, uh, to, to pick up a point you made, sort of uh, said a bit more on after I posted my question. I, I mean, the te technical side of how to do this seems ridiculously simple to me. Um, uh, but you focused on the fact that, you know, the culture change was the hard part. I just wondered if you could expand a bit more on how you actually did that and, and how much effort was involved. Yes, that's fine. Let's take that as the first 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 question. Yeah. Um, so the from a, a local government point of view, um, my context was very much that the um, uh, the budgets were declining, and the complaints were going up. And that was because a lack of understanding of the grassland ecosystem was leading to cuts being too harsh, too, too, too quick. So local members were all ears. So I got senior politicians who were ready to listen to an ecologist. And by and large, most ecologists kind of green woolly hatted brigade, you know, they're largely inconvenient. We're all about newts and bats and things like that. And the reality is we're far, far better than that. And we have interesting things to say, I think, from time to time. And 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 so they were very keen to support a new strategy. And I think what I did at the county council was to get embedded within the as quickly as possible a new strategy towards low fertility grasslands being our long term aim so that became um, a, a report that uh, that I, I wrote 
and was taken to our cabinet for endorsement. And that meant from then on, that was the policy of the county council, is that we would work towards low fertility soils because we could see the benefits. So once you've got the political acceptance, most other things fall in um, behind that. So it's, you know, if this were the, the agency, this is about getting senior, senior level acceptance of this being an approach where why wouldn't you do this? And if you do require fertile soils and lots of mowing, then you have to justify it. And that's, and that's what I was saying is that we will only use very fertile soils and grassland where that is that is a purposeful design we won't simply do it by rote by history by 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 common commonplace practice that we've um, that we've had over over the years and that goes for all sorts of design i mean even and i think how i've managed that more recently is with uh, as was highways england now national highways i've got to their um uh, their england design panel to present to them and now Highways England, as now National Highways, they have uh, fairly recently issued their um, an instruction, uh, a major project instruction, which is you will no longer be using topsoil only by justification, but your default is no topsoil on any of your road verges. Yes, I know that's going to be a whole significant change to the way that projects are managed, but that is now Highways England policy. I mean, all I did was present. They have then taken that on. They could see the benefits nationally in, in reduced maintenance and higher biodiversity, and that is now their policy. Obviously, you know, there, there, there will be occasions when there's vast amounts of topsoil and there's nothing much you can do with it. There is a limit to where you can hide this stuff. Um, and so you have to rein back. But if the overall policy is driving this that says don't use it anymore, then then we move into a different sphere in our in our built environment. So uh, top level is really important. And I think then as we go down the levels, it's about community buy in. And, um, you know, I've been to quite a few parish council meetings where I've discussed, uh, you know, what what does it mean to have a neat and tidy um, parish? What does it mean? What do you want out of these grasslands? And of course, there's argument in there. People love that the beautiful greens and flat grasslands and moan. And it, there's something very there's something very quintessentially English about it. But it is something that's all over the world. Moan grassland happens, um, but but we we are wedded to it. But that doesn't mean to say we have to have it everywhere. And every village, town, uh, city can find spaces where it does no longer need to mow grass the amount that it does. But if you simply stop mowing the grass, you do end up with very tall weeds. You do end up with lots of spear thistles and, and creeping thistle and ragworts and the rest of it. They, they will come in and present those to your maintenance teams. And they'd look at you like, well, what have you just done? And that's because you're not understanding that ecosystem. So it's about explaining to people who matter, who have influence, what it is the change is about. And I think providing that's done on a fairly regular basis via PDFs on websites, me on YouTube, um, it, they're me presenting to people, then I think there's um, there's every opportunity to get this change embedded within the communities that uh, have influence over grassland uh, maintenance and design. Thanks, that's, that's a, a very clear and, and full answer. I must just make an, a comment myself because I'm like that. Um, I get very upset by seeing all these people on their lawns putting on weed and feed just so they can oh. have a monoculture on their lawn. Why? Anyway, that's yes. that's that's, that's for oh, somewhere that's else, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the second question I had. So uh, very interested. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the link you sent yet. We've been uh, trying to work out more about soil carbon and we can't find much actual data except on agricultural land. Are yeah. there any links you can give us for non agricultural land? We're particularly interested in the fact, you know, we do quite a lot of construction work and what's that doing to the carbon uh, when we're doing construction work, for example? Right. Well, look, uh, you know, freely, I'm not I'm not an expert here. Um, I mean, I've been scrabbling as you have for for data. Um, the, uh, there's the report that Syme produced um, at the bottom of that slide, and I see somebody's kindly popped that in the in the chat link. Um, uh, 
that report was produced by Penny Anderson and I th that was earlier this year. So it was only April this year and it's a synthesis of the information that's there. It's a dense synthesis. So I, I, I commend it to you to read because it's full of information. I've just drawn out a few a few factoids out of it. Um, the other the other references would be Natural England's um, research report, and I can't quite remember which number it is that they've got to, but there is um, a carbon and habitats Natural England report. It may be if somebody's agile enough to to Google that now, they can pop that in there. But uh, is it in? Uh, any uh, I'd say so is it 90 something or I might I might if not I'll pop it in to over to Anita and we can send it around afterwards but there's a natural England research report dealing with carbon and habitats there's an early one from 2011 I think and then there's an updated one in the last couple of years um, and that's that is that's fulsome um, but it doesn't quite go to I think the answer you want Martin which is when we're doing construction how best to do it what are our what are our options and you know if we are you know, if we want to go out there and plant trees in our in our open habitats you know should they be grassland first should they not be grassland look at that thank you bethany <laughs> excellent wonderful that's the power of the internet these days isn't it thank you very much so there's a, there's another good report I mean, it's a very long report and it's got um it's got uh, appendices was with annexes with it, so so it's uh, that's 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 well worth a um, a dig in. But I think there's as there's less research than you might like to yeah. see on this. And one of the one of the interesting habitats, if you think of some of our best, and you think of in your Thames region, you know chalk grasslands. How much research is there on carbon and chalk grasslands? And the answer is almost none. And yeah. and and what's really really interesting is of course these are skeletal soils, the the soils that hold the most carbon. In the in the early stages are those which are the richest. So those that have got the highest humic material, hold the greatest carbon. So there we there we are. There's there's a conundrum for us where I'm saying low fertility soils, thin <laughs> soils, which hold the highest biodiversity potentially have the lowest carbon but but think of it more as the as the whole of life cycle where you've got to maintain that grassland so if you look in at the highest intensity grasslands are almost certainly carbon negative because of the amount of maintenance that is required and the fertilizer that's put on so the so the so everything else so yes there's plenty of carbon stored in that high intensity grassland but in order to get the products out from that you are having to use an awful lot of carbon to do so think of that in the low fertility soil situation where look there are some motorway verges and i've got some fabulous examples does it porchester between Fareham and and um Portsmouth on the south facing verge there constructed in the 1980s has never ever been maintained it's wonderful wildflowers and is now about 50 percent scrub after 40 years no maintenance at all looks fantastic that has been acquiring carbon probably ever since you know the, the diggers left and 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 now will be quite an impressive carbon source and it's all positive so you know, it, it it depends on your viewpoint, doesn't it, as to whether, but but some, you know, the lower the fertility of the soils, probably the less carbon that they can instantly store. But I don't think we should worry about that. By and large, the more diverse the grassland, whether it's on thin or thick soils or humic soils, will acquire more carbon. That's but it's but it's you know early days, and I just don't think we've got the, those nuggets that we really want to to plug this away but i think we should feel confident that increasing biodiversity increases the capacity for storing carbon period i think we should be out there promoting that as being a very important quick way of storing carbon thanks Phil. We've, we've had another question from Leslie. Um, was there any retrofitting of low fertility grassland, i.e. scraping off of topsoil? Ah, uh, yes, I, I've only had 15 minutes to give you a presentation. Yes, and that's, um, I think, uh, I think we have to be a bit careful about retrofit. Uh, I mean, it has to be purposeful. I think it you can produce very high biodiversity in, in, in very small areas. So um, I've been, 
looking after a project in London Borough of Croydon and Bromley, where we have uh, been doing soil scrapes. So taking away the couple of inches to three inches of topsoil in public parks and verges um, in those boroughs and then sowing wildflower seed on those perennial wildflower seed to encourage wildflowers, butterflies into into uh, urban areas. And that has been very successful, but it's the scale of it, isn't it? Once you get into soil moving, then you end up with very big piles of stuff and it's expensive if you need to move it off site and it can be unsightly. And the other thing is once when you've if you're leaving that rich stuff on site, it ends up growing very tall weeds and then scrub. So it's about using that purposefully, understanding where you're going to move that material. But it is very successful. The other place that uh, we've used it successfully in Dorset is um, in one occasion where we've um, got an accident black spot. So a very high um, um, uh, vehicle accident spot as a result of poor visibility uh, where a, a T-junction where you're just coming up to on the rise and you can't see over the vegetation for oncoming traffic. So that traditionally would have had 10 times a year been mown. Um, so under my direction, that verge was removed. So all the soil was removed and replaced with limestone chippings um, and then just sown with a basic wildflower mix. Uh, for the first two years, it had no maintenance at all because it didn't need it. And since then, it has one cut a year, one just over cut a year. That's it. So um, clearly you can use the soil strip, uh, you know, purposefully for a variety of functions. And that's one of the things I think Highways England are very keen to do is leading up to big junctions, uh, roundabouts, is, is to avoid the need for having maintenance on those, is why are we putting topsoil on there? So they're going to stop that from now on. And, and that is, so effectively that's a, a design way of doing it, but, but you can of course go there and retrofit. And on one road verge in Dorset, uh, on the Bournemouth Spur Road, the A338 from Ashley Heath down into Bournemouth, there was a 17 kilometer uh, strip which had to be rebuilt. And the verge is either side of that. The topsoil was then stripped off that and um, and was, was put in buns elsewhere um, in order to increase the biodiversity and reduce the maintenance liability because it obviously has to be mown at night um, under uh, you know, traffic management, which is very expensive. So again, the driver was mainly cost. The gain is, is all in the biodiversity there. I think we've probably got time for one more question, if that's OK, Phil. Yes, of course. Um, I think this there is one. Leslie's asked another one, and I think it's um, a good one. With the requirement to protect the face of flood buns from erosion, how can we reach a balance between a well-meshed sward and one that is more biodiverse? Right, that's really, that's very interesting. Um, I, I mean, I think, again, I'd, oh, I'd love to have the research on it, but we need to be using our native herbs as as um, bioengineering tools more so than we are doing. So cut and collect is undoubtedly a sensible way to 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 create a tight sward because you create tillers, lateral growth, and 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 that helps to anneal soil. And it can also help you know in in dry conditions if there are um you know if there are leaks or anything you can you can see you can see where you've got a wet patch and and, and material growing but but for species some are clovers bird's foot trefoil um you know seem to me to be really important herbs which have got deep rooting properties you know they are there and will fix soil they will fix material rather better than grasses to be honest and and i think we're how can we well we've got to try it somewhere I think that's the point is I wouldn't expect people to think oh wonderful we can just use bird's foot trefoil instead of grasses now on on some new reservoir bank you know we we need to, we need to do it but I just think we've become completely hooked with using ryegrass swords because ryegrass is tough and it does the job it does it very well indeed but it is just biodiversely useless it's a hopeless grass and almost nothing feeds on it. There's almost no caterpillars of moths that have anything to do with it. It's too hard. It's tough. 
But if we could use an alternative, if we could get a more diverse sward with with um, particularly legumes in there, I think we would end up with something that is much more biodiverse. We we know how to maintain it. We know through cut and collect we can keep a tight sward on that and that will encourage those herbs to, to thrive. And I bet you they'll perform the same engineering function, but I can't prove it now. Absolutely, Leslie. Sounds like a research project is needed. It is needed. We need to look at our native flora for the bioengineering benefits that they can offer because, you know, we can win win on this. You know, we can provide, I think, some really good uh, structures, good structural support through using through using um, um, native flora. Um, but but, you know, we just don't know at the minute. That's it, I think um, we, we've, um, you've answered all the questions. Oh, Bill. Thank oh, you very excellent. much. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Super. Um, well, brilliant. I mean, I mean thank you. You know, that's uh, I think if there's any chance in design, I, I don't know whether they're um, you know, there are particular opportunities for design, but I mean, if anybody's interested, you know, I'm I'm here. I'm on a four or five year project. Basically, I'm working part time now, so it's more or less. I think my contract ends at the end of 2023. Um, so if people would like to contact me to get any more bespoke advice, um, then then please just ask. I mean, increasingly now I'm getting involved in um, in ad advice to farmers. Um, so although my project has been principally around um, the built environment, um, actually we're moving away from, well not away from it, but it, it's it's naturally uh, going into farmers who are into minimum tillage and uh, regenerative agriculture, or they want uh, partridge on their land or something like that. And, and, you know, because they're finding that the land is too rich to support most of these things. And so they want to know how to reduce Soil fertility in some areas in order to encourage the wildflowers and the insects for the 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 uh, ecosystem services that they're trying to generate. So this this system works anywhere. It's just a grassland ecosystem, whether this is farmland or whether this is amenity grassland. It does it doesn't matter. Brilliant, Phil. Thank you very very much for that. And I was just going to pick up that Phil was saying he's really really happy to be contacted. Um, and also, Phil, can I just confirm that you're happy for um, people to use your slides if they need to kind of, you know, change hearts and minds? Oh, because... ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you're free to do that. I mean, all of this is, um, you know, you you'll see some of these slides any almost any anywhere these days. So, yes, help yourselves. Please, please feel free to uh, to pillage my, my talk to, for use elsewhere. That is brilliant. Thank you very much, Phil. I think we've all kind of... Um, We've all bought into it, and I think we're now to really go out there and kind of set this concept. So thank you very, very much for today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Emma Hill just to um, round us up and um, close the expo. Thank you, Emma. Oh, thanks, Anita. And just a, a big thanks from, from me too uh, for that. Um, Phil, that was uh, that was really thought provoking as a, as a geologist and former um, career grass cutter for a, a local authority subcontractor i um i certainly took note of a lot of what you said there i think there's a lot for the business as well that we can uh, take back and grapple with i i've been given the honor of closing the expo so i'm not going to keep you long um we'll hopefully have you out before the hour is up um and i, I just wanted literally a, a chance to offer some reflections really um just to draw us to a close um, it's been a fantastic event and um, what a wonderful way to spend this sunny Friday morning um, hearing something that we probably don't make enough space for as part of the day job. Um, just opening our eyes up to this culture shift that's required, I think making space for this expo. Um, it's gathering pace and I'm sure it will come back next year uh, with more force than ever before. So we've had so many contributions from staff and, and other organisations. And over the course of these last five days, we have jam packed in a programme uh, with these fantastic guest speakers, such as Phil, that we've just heard from there. Hopefully we've kept everyone enthralled, intrigued, whetted appetites for people from far and wide. I, I know across the South East, not just, not just Thames. So um, fantastic participation. Um, we've brought bite-sized sessions covering many and varied. Uh, so in the spirit of uh, hopefully not too much like the 12 days of Christmas, I thought I'd just just recap on the last five days worth of events just to, to remind us what we've had. And we started with a bit of context, really, from um, 
our very own, as was Alistair Driver, uh, who's now the director of Re Rewilding Britain. Um, and he kicked us off with a session on the wider benefits of biodiversity, um, focusing specifically on rewilding. And I know there were some technical issues, but I don't think that that dampened any of the spirits or the, um, the interest in what was being conveyed during that very first opening session. Uh, day two, Penny Borton from Jacobs uh, brought us a bit more of an economic focus to the biodiversity uh, topic. Uh, she focused very much on the economic aspects in as much as how we value natural capital. And we moved on to day three to how we apply this. So we started to look at uh, biodiversity with our capital programme. Um, we had Emily Cook from, again, Jacobs, providing an overview and some case studies. Um, and we actually had some of our own Oxford scheme uh, come and talk to us about biodiversity net gain. Um, we had Nick Westerman from Jacobs. We had Penny Burt and Graham Scully. Um, all outlining how uh, we're using some of this to shape the environmental design aspects of, of, of the scheme that will be delivered in the next few years. On day four, uh, we had another two-parter, so the event is in full flow at this point. Um, we broadened out the focus to biodiversity and the wider perspective, so landscape and heritage, and, and one specifically close to, to my heart with my um, environment planning and engagement portfolio. We had uh, Joe Ald, one of the uh, catchment coordinators, come along and present about the um, recent award-winning even load natural flood management case study um, which Joe has been sort of project managing alongside the catchment partnership since 2016. Um, we also had Joe Monkhouse who took us to places that we have never been quite literally. Um, by this I meant the lost soundscapes of Iron Age Somerset so we got to experience firsthand how the sounds of the diversity uh, and environment around us then has differed so much to it is now, providing, I think, incentive, if nothing else, uh, to do more to protect what we've got now. Um, brings us on to today, where we've had more of the innovation, the good news stories, the successes, those sort of sparks of um, ideas for us all to take forward. And I, again, just a big thanks uh, to, to Phil for for the slides, for, the, for the, the question and answer session, for taking us through what quite clearly is very passionate about, but also is something that very much could apply to us. I think it shows just these simple steps uh, are all it takes. And when I say all it takes, that's not uh, diminishing the point which has been made a few times, which is the cultural backdrop has to be in the right place for that to be, um, uh, to be right. So having had those five days worth of um, enlightenment interest around biodiversity, if you've missed anything along the way, you're now left kicking yourselves or you didn't quite get enough the first time round. Martin and others have said at the beginning that actually the access to these materials will be on SharePoint. I think that's going to be from uh, the 8th. Uh, maybe don't quote me on that, but uh, next week. Um, similarly, there'll be opportunity to feedback. I mean, these sessions are only as good as as we make them and, and your feedback will really help the uh, biodiversity and the eco group to shape next year's events. I think we'd like ideas, we'd like suggestions. So feedback will come in the form of a weekly buzz survey. Again, I think that will come through next week. So keep, keep your eyes peeled and do be forthcoming with that because it, it really does help us all to, to shape these sessions to get the best out of them. And I don't want to dilute any more of what you've heard by waffling on at this stage. So just a huge, huge final thank you um, for all of the fantastic guest speakers that we've had. Uh, to everyone that's contributed to making this such a fantastic programme this year. Um, as I've said, the Thames Eco Group, the Biodiversity um, Expo Planning Group and others. I won't even attempt to name um, the crew behind this, but big, big thanks. And, and finally, to all of you that have dialed into these sessions, have asked questions, have shown interest, have been enthused. Um, you know, big thank you. There's real opportunities ahead for all of us. We just need to um, uh, to keep making space for sessions like this and keep applying it to what we do in the in the day job, as it were. With that, with one minute to spare, I'll thank you all and just check in. Anita, have I covered everything? Shall we say goodbye and close it there? I think that's a, a great idea, Phil. Could you possibly just pop your last slide up because people are asking for your contact, and I think you you've got your contact on the. Um, no, it's gone blank. Uh, 
Um, sorry, Anita, yes, what I will do is I will just add my contact details to that, resend you a link so you can then forward that to, to around there. So, point so everybody can yeah, so, I'm sorry about that. I thought it was on there, but it doesn't appear to be, does it? Anyway, That's there we brilliant. go. Lovely. Thank you very much, Phil. You're very welcome. Nice Thank to see you, you all and um, hopefully see some of you again at some point. Thank you. Bye all. Thanks, Phil. Cheers. Bye-bye now. Bye now. Thank you.